What's good, people? It's Talk Your Walk. I'm with my co-host. Just kidding. He's the host. <laughs> Austin. Okay. My producer. You didn't even... You know what? Uh, hi, I'm George. I don't do the intro. We're off to y'all. a great start. Yeah, you're... I don't do the intro. I was like, I'm going to give him do the intro. I, no, well, I was going to be... Told me I was like, do. hey, no, why don't you go ahead and do this intro? I'm sorry. I was like, I wanted to give no... Okay, give a man a little bit more notice, please. Wait, right, you know what? Right. Y'all right. want to know what my favorite part about this whole thing? No. Huh. The guests always look so confused whenever we start. <laughs> like, what, what is going, going on? on? Anyways. We're joined by, I don't know, can you guys do something? Anything? Yeah, I, of course. <laughs> Should uh, I do the intro? <laughs> dude, <laughs> hey, at this point, dude, it'd probably be better off. Today, we're joined by Josephus Lyles. Um, Noah, if you want to go ahead and give us a little bit of backstory, you have more connections with Josephus than well, me and George do. I grew up with Joe. Um, when did we meet? Like, five, eight? 10. Man, I couldn't even tell you. It was before. It was a I, long it was time like ago. Three or four or something like that. I think my first, my one of my first memories is the birthday party with you and Noah. Yeah. And then I got you both um, the Star Wars character, and it was like Count Dooku and Luke Skywalker. And then I gave you the Luke Skywalker one, <laughs> and I was like, oh wait, no, it's and like when I switched them out, like so I gave Noah the other one or whatever, and I remember you were just like. Oh, like, you look so sad. Like, you look so hurt. I don't know why to this day, but that's, like, my first memory. But, uh, so I know you run, so you run track, and you got your own um, photography and videoing and whatnot. Tell me more about that. Uh, so, I guess we'll start off on the track, because that's, like, my main profession. Uh, I'm a professional athlete. I run for Adidas. They are my sponsor, and, um, you know, hopefully the goal is the Olympics, but the way kind of track works is... You know, we run uh, between around, like, April to September, October. That's our main season. Uh, we'll have a lot of meets in Europe, you know, some meets in America and stuff like that. And, you know, we pretty much race and we make money that way as well as, like, we're sponsored by, like, Nike, Adidas, New Balance, like, different shoe companies. And the shoe companies will pay us as well. So that's kind of how, you know, we make our living. Yeah, I've worn Nike to their house because it's sponsored by Adidas. Yeah. So I wore Ni- all Nike <laughs> they to kick their you house out. once. They kick you out? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They were pissed. Oh, they yeah. were so bad. My mom was like, uh. uh what you wearing those Nike socks for, boy? <laughs> I, I, think it's, I think it's fascinating because I don't, I don't think a lot of people know exactly how having a profession in track and field really works, especially after you get out of, you know, the collegiate level of it. Yeah, definitely. So it's actually really interesting because in a lot of Olympic sports, you know, sports that are, like, mainly, like, people care about Olympics, like, swimming, gymnastics, track, stuff like that. Yeah. People, you know, they just assume that we just train for the Olympics 24-7, like, four years. You know, we're all just training for one thing. But that's actually not the case. Like, we have uh, world championships every two years. So, this year, in 2019, there's a world championships. Wow. And then 2021, there's a world championship. Where where's that being held at? Uh, so, this year, it's in uh, Doha, Qatar. The, what? Uh, I know I play uh, guitar as an instrument, no. but that's Doha, <laughs> Doha, Qatar. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, Still don't know. So where's that? Uh, in the world? It's in like the Middle East. Okay. Uh, it's right next to Saudi Arabia. Oh, it's like you know what? Country. I have. I actually have. It starts with the Q, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Qatar, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, like in 2017, it was in London. Um, wow. 2015 so you, is in traveled. Beijing. You've traveled. <laughs> Uh, a little bit. That's one of the the big things about track and field. Like a lot of the uh, track meets are like around the world. So, um, you know, even talking about next month, like I'll probably like be out the country for a long time. Um, so our season's really like based in Europe mostly, predominantly, mm-hmm. and then uh, you know, the world championships will be like in you know either you know South America or Asia, or, you know, um, the Middle East, like uh, wherever. Um, How long have you been doing this? So, I'm 20 right now. I went professional out of high school. Wow. Which is not very, uh, like, it's not seen, it's not common. Mm -hmm. Um, Me and my brother actually both did, Noah Lyles as well. And um, we were were originally signed to the University of Florida. We were supposed to run track there on a track scholarship. And, you know, we were running fast that year. And we had kind of, like, seen it coming a little bit. And, you know, the opportunity arose, so we ended up going and signing with Adidas and, you know, foregoing the colleges. Yeah. So that kind of works on a scout level of, like, they have people at when you're with these colleges to see if they can recruit you, I'm guessing. Um, so in a professional sense, like, they have, like, certain, yes, yeah, scouts and everything like that. 
Uh, most of the time, they're not really scouting like high school kids. They'll look more at like the college level. So then y'all ran for UF. For, no, we never ran for you. Okay, oh, so wow. they so they pulled. Okay, okay. You made it to the party, right. but you didn't get the stack. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. We just we just signed the we just signed the national letter of intent to go there, and literally like the summer before we went in 2016, um, we ended up you know the Olympic trials was that year, and my brother had ended up running like really fast at the Olympic trials, and he got fourth, and he was an alternate for the Olympic team. Wow. And uh, at like 18 years old, and we were looking at you know some of the um companies before then and so that was like one of the like the the seal and the deal type things where it's like all right you know uh let's make that move <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so then why why pure athletics like uh so pure athletics is like that's that's who that's our uh, training group and that's who our like our coach kind of made that and they have you know uh or my coach he has a lot of he's had a lot of really good athletes he's been coaching for a really long time so like um, he coached like Tyson Gay, who's the American record holder in the hundred. He coached like um, Shawnee Miller, and she's the Olympic champion in 2016 in the 400. And just like a lot of, like he has a lot, like a lot of medalists, a lot of Olympic medalists and World Championship medalists. So like that's a big thing into you know um, training. And we originally lived in Virginia, or we lived in Virginia when we were in high school. Um, actually, you know, a Gainesville native. <laughs> yeah. 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 Just putting that out there. <laughs> But uh, we we lived in Virginia when we were in high school, and you know the weather up there it's not always the best. In Florida, Texas, California, like those states have really good weather. So um, we train in Claremont, Florida, just outside of Orlando, and you know the weather's good pretty much all year round. Universal's like right there, <laughs> so yeah. That. But but uh, look, tell me more. So getting away from the sport itself, but like more of like the social aspect of it. So. Going straight, going from high school, you were living like a normal high school life. Well, not really normal, but because you probably were like training 24-7, am I right? More or less, yeah. Yeah, so going from that to boom, like all of a sudden I'm pro or, you know, like how how does that, how does that, what is that, what's the impact on your life? Yeah, because uh-huh. from the sounds of it, it doesn't seem like you've got to, I mean, it of it's like you skipped a step it. in life. You just kind of, <laughs> right. you know what I mean? You yeah. didn't get to really experience that like 18, 19, like teenage type of life, it seems like. Well, let me tell you, when I first went pro and we were living like with my mom and everything like that, and we ended up moving to Florida. So it was me and my brother and we lived together. And it was kind of crazy. I'm going to just put it like this. I couldn't cook at all. <laughs> <laughs> so I still can't. So I pretty so much had to learn how to do everything by myself. Or um, just off the rip, like, you're like, all right, you know, I'm turning in papers for, like, my senior project or whatever. And then, you know, two months later, you know, I'm looking, like, I'm paying taxes and I'm, you know, living by myself. And I, like, you know, you got to buy this and buy that. And it's, like, it's it's really a growing experience. And, you know, kind of the thing I learned mostly from that is it's it's not as hard as people think it is. Like, you know, when you're younger, you're like, uh, you know, like everybody wants to be old, but nobody wants to have responsibility, yeah. but it's, it's, it's not as hard. It's a little, it's, it's a little challenging, especially like for like the first year you go into that lifestyle and especially like how, um, our training group is and just like being in that atmosphere is everybody is a lot older than us. Like I'm the youngest person in our group. I'm 20 and I've been the youngest person since I'm 18 and we have people that are up to like 35, 36 who are training with. So when I first got there, like uh, I think the closest person in age to me was like 24. Um, so just that experience, like not even being in the same uh, like generation technically, like, you know, people like, you know, I was born in 1998. So that's like that technology. Yeah, age type 98. Stuff. And so uh, <laughs> that's like that technology age. So just going and being around just older people is like it, it was definitely a, a kind of like a like a culture shock almost where it's like okay you know I'm I'm a kid but I kind of can't be a kid yeah. anymore and then even going on the circuit which is like the uh, you know the meets and track and track and field like going to the meets and stuff like that and I feel like this baby and everybody else is like older and you'll get in races with like Olympic champions and all that kind of stuff and you're like you know it's a lot of pressure yeah it's a lot of I'm not um, sure. Maybe even if it's not from other people, it's from you. Because, of course, you want to do well and everything like that. And you go into these races and you just, just this lifestyle where it's like everybody's older than you, more mature than you. They've had like five or six more years, more experience than you. So 
I would say that's probably one of the more challenging things. And I guess in any field as well, like when you're trying to get started in a field and you're like, uh, you know, people have so much more experience than you and stuff like that. Even if you're like well qualified, it doesn't matter because there's so much like more that they have, like just in terms of like years. Right. Like yeah. they've been around longer. So I was about to say, you find yourself in a unique position where you have all these people that have all this wisdom and guidance to give you. And it, I mean, say from the sounds of it, you were the youngest person to be a part of it. So being around that, I'm sure that had to have like impressioned you in a certain way with your career. Uh, yeah, definitely. I think one of the, the, the best things about our training group, uh, you know, they're very helpful. They're very supportive. So even now, um, like I've been in it like two or three years, so I, I would say like I'm I'm kind of used to it now. But even now, like there's so many people who have been at the top, like been those Olympic champions, everything like that. And they're always passing down knowledge. They're always giving us like advice and stuff like that, even if it's not necessarily about um, the the running but it'll be like about like you know like you know being smart with your money or doing these are the mistakes i made don't do that yeah, exactly <laughs> and, it, and you know it's it's so helpful because to have people like that around you to like be able to be like all right you know you you gotta you gotta you know don't get too caught up in this and that and these rankings and everything like and it's just like little things that you think don't matter but they really do like the it's just like things that people tell you that you know, you, you kind of take for granted and, and you really shouldn't like, you know, a lot of people have wisdom and you don't really notice it or you don't value it until later. That mentality, um, or like how you said, you were talking about like, you ever, did you ever get psyched out, you know, when you, when you first started? Cause you were talking about, you know, being in the realm of, you know, a lot of different people who are older than you, who have been doing this longer than you, um, how does that how did that make you feel, you know, personally on like a personal level? How would you how, how did you handle it? You know, and then how did you grow from it? Um, so I say at first, you know, being around like, you know, just so much more, so much more mature people. It's, it's actually kind of funny because in, in athletics in general, not just like track, but I feel like in, in most sports, we're on that professional athlete level. Everybody just kind of stays young because they're around that culture. Yeah. So they, they just never grow up. So you'll have like 30 year old people who kind of act like kids <laughs> and yeah. then you'll have like, like or you could have like 30 year old people who like act like a, like mature adults. So like you'll have like one person who has kids and is like super mature and is yeah. like, all right, you know, I got practice and then I'm gonna kick my kid up from school or whatever. And then you have the other person who's like, all right, I'm. I'm 30 and I'm about to go to the club. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's hilarious because there's so many different uh, personalities and so many different maturity levels, even though, you know, people tend to be a certain age. Um, it was at first it was definitely uh, what's the word? I would say it definitely I, I would say I felt pressured a like little intimidated. bit intimidated. That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, intimidated, especially when I got to racing like uh being 18 year old and racing these people yeah i remember uh <laughs> it's funny because one of my best friends now matthew hudson smith he was uh in the good Olympic. old matt <laughs> yeah <laughs> no one knows him but he's a shout out to t and crumpet <laughs> <laughs> he's from the uk and he's uh he was in the olympic final like the year before and it's 2017 and it was at a meet and it was my first race and i'm in like lane three or four and he's in the lane outside of me and it's in high school, you know, you don't really have them as much competition when, you know, you were coming out as good as like me or my brother. So yeah. I'm like, all right, it's, it, we were in the 400 meters and it's a lap around the track and we stay in lane. So the the first hundred, I'm like, and all right. For, for y'all who don't run track, I ran it once like my senior year. It is not a good time, <laughs> especially if you're not in shape like them. It is not a good time. OK, yeah. go ahead. So it's considered like one of the harder events. So. Yeah. I'm used to like running up and catching the fr the person in front of me like in the first like couple meters cuz I'm not used to like running against people who with such high, you know, um skill levels and People stuff. like you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so major athleticism. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I remember I went out like super fast and I got to like halfway through the race and I'm like out there. Like I'm I'm running and the 400 is one of the races you kind of have to pace a little bit it's still a sprint though and so i remember matt just blasting me in the last 200 <laughs> oh, just man. just leaving me and i ended up getting like sixth in the race 
Oh, and I was so hurt. Oh, and, you know, looking back at it, I remember he told me, because he's one of my best friends now, he told me, he was like, yeah, I remember that one race and you got out. And I was like, I don't know what this fool thinks, but he going to die. <laughs> 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 and he said he saw my, my back break at like oh. two, at 250 and he was like, oh, bet. <laughs> and he just oh, like man. whooped me. And so it's funny because looking back at that, it's like, um, like in that race, I wasn't really doing what I should have did. Like I felt like I, I was intimidated. So because of that, I didn't perform to my best abilities. I didn't go out and like execute like a good race plan. And so I guess that's probably like one of the biggest times, like I would say like intimidation, like it is real. And almost for like the whole first year of me running, it was kind of like, I was kind of running like that, like almost intimidated, kind of scared. And it, it's, it's not good. <laughs> Would you say it's been a, uh, you know, it's going to be a weird way to put it, but I think with any professional athlete or any type, any time that you're in a career like that, it can either be very volatile or it can be very welcoming and friendly. And it sounds like you had a lot of friendly competition, you know, people around you that wanted to bring you up. Yeah. Uh, I would say even the sport is interesting. Uh, people are friendly and then people aren't friendly yeah it really. depends <laughs> yeah i've met a, I've met a couple of them yeah, yeah athletes athletes are intense you know you put yourself in a lifestyle where you're physically putting your body on the line to compete against other men that's something that's going to drive something in you that's like i'm sure that not, i'm sure none of us here can even come close to understanding the pressure that's involved with you know wanting to move your way up in a career like that while also having to build these relationships yeah um it's really interesting i think one of the hardest things is uh, when you get on the line and stuff and you know in in high school and college I feel like is like uh, a major time when you build a lot of those relationships like a lot of people who are close to each other are usually like from college like they knew each other but when you get to like the professional level it's a uh, like it, it really comes down to like a money thing mm. like when you race and it's like all right there's this amount of money for the winner and then like if you second or third you know you're getting less and then if you're like you know last you might not be getting anything so it's yeah. like all right. It's all fun and games. <laughs> there's money involved. Yeah, you put it on the Seriously. line and it's like, all right. You know, like, of course, you know, you want to be friendly with people. You don't want to, you know, be a terrible person or a jerk or anything like that. And I would say, like, there's a lot of, like, camaraderie in track as well. But sometimes it's like, it just comes down to, like, you're on the line and you're like, all right, you know, I want your money. I want your money. <laughs> I want your money. I'm going to get your money. I'm going to get your yeah. money. <laughs> it's like, and, and like that last 100 meters and, you know, depending on the person because track is not necessarily like the most well-paced sport you know we're not making like a lot of people aren't making millions you know there are a couple of people outliers that are making like a lot of money and there are some people who aren't making like almost any money and there's some people who actually don't have shoe contracts and stuff like that so because of that they're not they're really only getting the money from winning meets and stuff so like when it comes to that you get on the line and it's like okay well this might be dinner <laughs> yeah. hey. or something like that for yeah. some people. Yeah. So I feel like know. that's a giant misconception with a lot of professional athletes is that they're, you know, you hear the word professional athlete and you're thinking, oh, they must be making oh, bank. Yeah. Oh, but well at the end off. of the day, you're paying for not only the, you know, it, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you're paying the people that you're sponsored with or like the people that you work with to work with them or the people that are training you where you train at. I mean, how does that all work? Yeah. So like, um, you have to pay your coach and stuff like that. And, you know, it's different for everybody. But in situations, you know, your your shoe company will pay you and then you'll pay your coach and you'll pay for, to get your treatment done. Like if you're getting like massages or you're getting like physiotherapy and stuff like that. And I mean, it, it, it's just like you're a business. So you're paying people to do stuff for you. And then hopefully you collect and then you can, you know, keep doing it. So, but, you know, like if you're not making a lot of money, then it's like, OK, well, you might not be able to have the best coach because you can't afford the best coach or you might not be able to have the best like um physiotherapy or like if you get injured you might not be able to have the best doctors because you know you can't afford the best doctors or something like that you know someone who's making like a little more money like they might like if they have an injury they might go to germany to get like work done that they wouldn't be able to get in america but not everybody can you know get that so it's yeah, <laughs> yeah so it has the potential of being a very high paying job and a very lucrative type of business model but also the upkeep is yeah can be ridiculous yeah as as with anything, it's a high risk, high reward. Yeah, exactly. So, and you're young. I mean, you're only twenty, but at the same time, you've got to be thinking about the toll that this is taking on your body, mentally, physically. I mean, it's it's a lot to handle, especially because you started so young. 
Yeah, so um, he's like, nah, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I feel great. Right. Screw I'm you, great. dude. I'm whatever, man. <laughs> so, I mean, honestly, I think a big thing about the sport, sports in general, probably even life, is like the the mental state of it and the psychology. Like, I I know I have a sports psychologist, and um, you know Diana McNabb, and she works with like the Olympic team and stuff like that. And um, I've been working for her with her for a couple years. And I would say, like, the mental part of the sport, sports in general, is a big deal because that can literally be the make or break. And, like, if you get in a race and you have eight people in the race and all of them are, like, this pretty much the same skill level, someone's going to win. So when it comes down to it, it's usually the person who has the strongest, like, mental is probably going to win the race. And, you know, like, when you lose or when you're winning a lot or you're losing a lot, like, all that, like, affects you. Uh, mentally, like it can, like you can, you know, be on a high, like super high, and you're winning, you're winning, you're winning, and then all of a sudden, you know, you know, you take a couple losses, and then you're destroyed yeah. because you're like, what the heck is wrong with me? Or you could be losing a lot, and you know, you could be the same way, or you could just be in the middle. Like, it, there's just so much stuff that goes into it. You could be, you know, training really well, and then you know, not performing or even like your relationships outside of track and field. Like if you have like a, you know, relationship, like a girlfriend and, you know, y'all are having problems. And then all of a sudden that, that carries over to your track life or your, you know, your professional life and like just your headspace in the whole, like in your whole life, like it's, it's, it's a make or break thing that could literally be your career. So I know, I know that, and correct me if I'm wrong. I know you had an injury, didn't you? Yeah. With your hip. It was it was your hip, right? Yeah, I tore my I tore my hip. Okay, so <laughs> how did that? So you know, you just explained all that. So how how did you deal with that? How did you deal with that injury? And then like the because I'm sure you had I know I know you had that mental state of just like oh man, my career's over. Yeah, what am yeah, I gonna like, do? I mean, what'd, what'd you do? do? I mean, it was it was kind of rough. Tell me that story. Um, so literally, I had um, I was in high school. It was my senior year, and it was probably, like, two months out for the Olympic trials. And, you know, I was really wanting to try to make that Olympic team. And I had went into a race. I was running the 200. And I took three steps out the blocks, and I just heard this loud pop. And I was just – next thing I knew, I was just on the floor crying, and I was on the ground. And then there was just people standing on top of me. And I was devastated. Like, I – at the time, I was I was just I was just like crying. It hurt. <laughs> so, you know, a couple like uh, you know, the end of the day goes by. I'm coming back. And I go to the doctors, and they're like, "Okay, it's just a strain. You know, you can come back in like a couple weeks." And I'm like, "All right, cool." So I'm on crutches. I'm in like a like you know, it's wrapped and taped up all that stuff. I'm on crutches, and I'm doing rehab. And in the middle of rehab my quad just starts bleeding like there's blood just pulling on the inside of it so then and you know this is one of those things where it comes to like you know I was in high school so I guess like the the first thought wasn't to get like an MRI because you know money yeah, <laughs> yeah. so I end up getting an MRI and they're like all right you have like a four or five centimeter tear wow in in your hip like I, uh oh and that's not good <laughs> And so they're like, you're going to be out for like six or seven months. And I'm like, like at the time, I'm like, all right, I'm okay. You know, like, and my mom is just bawling, crying. Uh, Cause like she knows what that means to yeah. me. But at the time, you know, I'm like, all right, I'm fine. You know, I can do that. You know, it's, it's just not my time. And so that summer, that happened in May of 2016. Within the next two months, we started talking about um, contracts with, you know, different companies and stuff like that. We started meeting with people. You know, stuff actually started happening. I remember we went to the Olympic trials and uh, for my brother. And um, Noah had ended up doing really well there. And that whole time we were talking to companies and all that kind of stuff. And I remember it was like the, the finals of the 400 at the Olympic trials. And I was like, I can't watch this race. Because <laughs> I felt like I should have been in it. Yeah. Like, I was like, that should have been me. So, even when I came back and started running again, and I remember I was terrible. Like, I could not run to save my life. I was going so slow. Yeah. Uh, my quad was had, like, atrophy, like, greatly so, which means, like, a lot of the muscle had just, uh, you know, I lost a lot of muscle in yeah. that leg. Like, 
weight wise i was down in weight so i was struggling in training and that was the first time i was training like professionally i had moved down with a coach so i was doing all this stuff and i'm I'm getting a little better getting a little better and then i compete in my first meet and it's an indoor meet in january and i do terribly i mean ah trash i was terrible and so um usa track and field they had some doctors come to like our track or whatever and they were looking at me and they were like yeah you shouldn't run for the whole year like your muscle your your leg is so weak that it's it like you could get injured again if you run on this and they gave me like all these exercise and rehab stuff to do and you know, i was doing them and i'm like i don't care what they say i'm running this year yeah. <laughs> so yeah. i'm just putting in work work after work like i mean this i was i was grinding grinding <laughs> i was just putting in work putting in work doing all my stuff staying on top of myself and you know all this time rocky I'm, music plays in the background <laughs> rocky music <laughs> <laughs> and all this time uh i'm i'm I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. All, you know, all the time I'm doing this, I'm still like, I'm getting better at training, but I'm still not training on that like professional level. Like I'm running like. What was your mindset during all this? Like, what do you, what do you, because I know you're talking to yourself. What's, what's going on in your head? Mentally, it's a lot of times you, you just can't think of where you're at. You just got to think of like where you're going. Because a lot of times people get caught up in like, the past or the present and you know it's good to live in the present when you're doing workouts and stuff like that but in terms of like if i'm doing well in training or if i'm not i just am like i know where i want to be and so all the little baby steps that i'm making is are gonna get me there so you know me going from like i'm in my first race as a professional outdoor and they had actually like the doctors came back they tested me and they were like wow this is crazy uh, your leg actually got so much stronger. We've never seen this before. Like, wow. in such a little bit of time because I'm just putting in so much work. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> like, I expected that because yeah. I know what I'm capable of. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when someone tells you something, you got to, like, you know, of course, I took what they said. Like, all right, you know, you don't need to run right now. So I'm a not run right now. But at the same time, it's like I'm going to do everything in my power so I can get back to that level. So the first couple of times I raced, I ran, you know, like slower than I was running in high school. I was running 46 seconds, which is still, it's not slow, but, you know, compared to me, it's not like what I wanted to be running. Doesn't meet your personal standard. Yeah, exactly. And so from like my first four or five races, and I started getting better in training, but I couldn't produce it on the track. And my coach is just like, you know, just just keep training. You, you don't need to do anything. Just crazy keep this swimming. Year. <laughs> just keep swimming. Yeah. <laughs> and so by the end of the year, I had actually ended up PR, and I ran like a personal best, and I ran a couple of meets in in Europe. And I I remember when I ran, I when I won my first professional race, it was a meet in Italy, and I won it, and I was so ecstatic because I mean I was getting fourths and fifths and sixths, and I won this race and. And I PR'd on the, in that race. I had a you know a new personal best, and I mean I wanted to cry. <laughs> I'm finally eating dinner tonight. Thank yeah. you. Oh my gosh, it and was in Italy. Like, yeah. <laughs> just let alone. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, I mean it was like, and it was like my first time in Europe as well. So, very I mean, first memory of Europe, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was like a a really big like step for me, like just knowing that I'm going in the right direction, and then. Um, you know, I ran a couple of meets after that and I was still doing solid and that was like the turning point where I was like, all right, I'm still on the right path because when you're, when you're training and you're doing, you're putting in so much work, but it's not showing on the, like, it's not showing where you're putting the work. It's like, oh, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I actually good? Am I never going to run fast right. again? Yeah. yeah. And, and then like when you, when that like little glimpse of hope, hope. comes, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, whew, all right, thank you. <laughs> It's like I know where I, I know where I, I know what I'm doing is good and what I'm doing is right. Yeah, I think it's safe to say there's a lot of athletes out there that don't that don't come back from an, from an injury like that. That's that's a comeback story. Yeah, none <laughs> yeah, of them ever. Something, yeah, none of them, none of them ever get. Sometimes never get that feeling of validation where you've done all this work, you've done you've done all this training and everything. You've you've just done everything that you can, but they're just not able to produce it on the track. But like you were able to do that, man. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. No, no, and I, dude, you're. I mean, I don't know. I know. Every sport is different, but you're not even in your prime. You're 20. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. for most men in professional sports, they're not in their prime until like 30, 32. Well, what, like is the prime? what is the prime for track? Um, I would say like pretty young. It's like 20 something, isn't it? Really? Like, it would be. Yeah, yeah. No, the prime is pretty young. 25 and 30. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. 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 Yeah. It's, it's young because. Yeah. You know, it's like t- between 25 and 30. Once, <laughs> you get like, yeah, yeah. once you get plus 30, a lot of times. Uh, Start to slow down. Yeah. Like, some, like not everybody, once, but. Once you, once you hit 25, it's just like. <laughs> it starts just going downhill from there. Yeah, they like to say it's like between twenty five and thirty is like your best years. That's when you usually do like the most. Like you'll you'll get your fastest times and stuff like that. Mm. And after thirty, a lot of times you gotta like slow down in training because your metabolism can't handle it. What what is a typical what is a typical training day? You know, like you wake up. All right. Cause I know you wake, you wake up at like what eight or something it's like. Seven. I wake up at like seven. Seven. Okay. So yeah. typical training day uh, or typical day. I wake up seven between seven and seven thirty. I'll go, you know, you, I make my eggs. I eat eggs, three eggs every morning for breakfast. I'm very I routine. Have like five. <laughs> I'm very routine. Uh, we have practice at nine, so we go to practice, and you know, we'll we'll go to the track. Everybody will get there. Um, we start warming up, and we'll warm up for about an hour, uh, just making sure that our muscles are moving right, doing drills, stuff like that, and then we'll do our workout. Depending on the day, depends on like the type of workout we'll have. Usually, like Thursday and Fridays, we'll have. I mean, um, Tuesdays and Fridays we'll have harder workouts. Um, Mondays and Thursdays we'll have um, a little bit easier workouts, a little bit more speed stuff. While the other days are a little bit more like strength, strength uh, you know, throw up type days. <laughs> and so we'll stay there until like eleven thirty. So we'll be at the track between like nine and eleven thirty, and then after that we'll go directly to the gym, and. A lot of times I'll have like a like I'll make a smoothie at home, uh, a protein shake or something like that. So I'll have a little bit of energy. Sometimes people get food in between going to, from the track to the gym, and around we'll start the gym around like between twelve and twelve thirty, and usually be there until like two o'clock. And then after two o'clock, you get to go home, and you know, depending on the day, you'll some people go to treatment, some people do this and that. Some people actually have lives and they, they actually do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> some people, some people have, have friends. Wow. wow. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean like jobs and stuff. Yeah. Like some people oh, have jobs. Wow, on top of actually do that. Like, wow. Um, most most of the people in my training group don't, but you know some people actually like they have businesses and they have jobs and stuff like that. Everybody has their own thing. Um, Takes so, a whole gives a whole new meaning to running a business, eh? Yeah. <laughs> no, you did not. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I didn't see that coming. <laughs> I was. I, I did not see. That. Yeah, go, keep going. You gotta get one in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, was I was. I was. I was waiting. I was. I was like. George is doing really good with no puns this episode. Right. I was like, <laughs> where is, is it coming, coming from? <laughs> oh my. I mean, for you, Josephus, what are you what are you building towards? What are you building for? Matt, in terms of like track, I wanna of course be Olympic champion. I wanna yeah. be like the fastest person ever. I can't I can't settle with being anything that's second. Yeah. But I wanna be the best ever. Um, but in terms of like in life in general, I would say I wanna leave somewhat of a legacy. Um, and I want to, I want to leave something for my kids. I would say like, I want to build up some type of wealth or something like that to support like my kids and make sure that they don't have to struggle or anything like that. Um, cause growing up, I remember like, you know, I've lived in a lot of different environments, I would say. So, uh, I've lived like that, you know, nice middle-class life as well as that, like, you know, poverty living off food stamps you know yep. not having really like getting your life's cut off and stuff like that like i've lived like both lives and i know for a fact that like i can't have my kids live in the in in like that poverty lifestyle so right yeah i mean you're coming from a position of unique ability to do what I'd safely say over 90% of the population can't do. And so to put yourself in that position and, you know, you're wanting to leave a legacy and do these things for your children, that those are all immensely great goals. It shows that you have your head on straight. It shows that you know what you're doing with your career. Um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's especially coming back from your injury. That's amazing. Do you guys, you guys got anything you want to add? No, I was going to say, I think it's my last question. Um, what would you, if you had three words to, help someone get out of that mental state of just like, man, I'm not, I'm not good enough, blah, blah, blah. Like I can't do this. I can't do that. Or they're just like beating themselves up kind of thing. Like what, what are those three words? 
Man, three words. Yeah. <laughs> That's not sure. I mean, all right. It's a little you, you, limiting. You don't have to say, you don't say three advice. words. But. I give some advice. I would say uh, don't put limits on yourself. I think a lot of times people put limits on themselves and, you know, think. Yeah, that's a, I'm not, I can't do three no, words. No, no, no. Three words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say don't limit yourself. That's three words. Don't limit yourself. That's the process. Yep. But a lot right. of people will limit themselves, you know, uh, because of their environment or because of what they see or what they know. You know, they think they can't attain something. They think they can't, you know, reach this goal. Like, even in track and field, like, you'll have young athletes and some of them, you know, they'll get to this spot and they're, you know, they'll see people running these super fast times out of their same age. Like, Oh my gosh, you know, Oh, why am I not running that fast? I'm yeah. training hard. And it's like, how can I reach that? And a lot of times it, it just comes within yourself. Like you believing that you can do it and not putting that limit on yourself where it's like, okay, well I remember when I was younger and I was maybe like a freshman in high school and I was a fast freshman. I was the number one freshman in the country in the U S but I didn't want to be that. I wanted to be like the best person in the U.S. So even as a freshman, I'm like, all right, what can I do to be number one? Mm. Yeah. And yeah. and then the next year, I went and won like the high school national championships as a sophomore, like at 15 years old. And so like, just never putting that limit on myself was like, I don't want to be the the best sophomore, the best freshman. I want to be the best person. I want right. to be the best high school. I want to make the Olympics out of high school. Like that type of mentality pushes you so far it's that lying that lying mentality <laughs> comparisons like comparisons the greatest enemy until you use it to benefit yourself you know you're being the best um thank you for being on joseph seriously man is there is there anything you want to plug as far as social media wise anything you got going on any any races you got going on oh uh or talk about talk more plug in your uh the j lyle's oh, yeah. production yeah, uh, yeah. yeah you can follow all right you can follow me at uh, Josephus underscore Lyles on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I have a photography page. I do a little some some. Uh, J so so Lyles. <laughs> <laughs> All right, J Lyles Productions. Y'all can follow me on Instagram on there. Um, and that's it. You know, kind of cool. So you know, yeah, links, links, <laughs> will be down, links will be down below for sure. <laughs> yeah, they'll um, all be in the description. Definitely. Thank you again for coming out and uh, driving from Claremont. <laughs> that's a little to drive. Ah, uh, no, that's fine. <laughs> It's like 45 minutes. <laughs> the way, actually, What's no, it's like an hour and a half. Hour and a half. It's like an hour and a half. Where you drive? It's an hour and a half. No, drive. Because, <laughs> I was going to say, because, like, I drive, I drive pretty <laughs> fast, but, like, bro, you drive super slow. Like, even following me here, you drive so okay, slow. Okay, I was driving slow because I was following you. I don't drive slow. Yes, dude. That's bad. <laughs> you you make it an hour and a half drive to 45 I was driving slow because I was following you. To be honest, when I was driving, like, I made it in, like, an hour. I've made it in an you, hour. You can turn an hour and a half drive into 45 minutes? That's terrifying. No, I made I was, the are you going 90? If you're going, like, if you're going I, yeah. at <laughs> night and there's no traffic, you can hit that drive in about an hour. Okay, see, that, that makes sense. If, yeah, like, if, if you're no going traffic, in the daytime, it's going to be so much traffic coming from Claremont. Like, that's on, true. On 70, or, well, yeah, 75, there's so much traffic coming in. Like, I don't know why. On Saturday <laughs> that's true. Morning. We that's were true. just that's about true. to end the episode. I feel like we need to talk about this, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. So, uh, we're check out, the guys. links in the description. Appreciate it. All right, we're, we're out.